Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Marcin Kleczynski, CEO of Mailware Bytes. Marcin, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, I'm excited. You're you're doing something that's kind of interesting, and you know you've you've been kind of doing this for a long time, and you're you have uh, quite an impressive background, especially for how young you are. Um, so maybe before we kind of get into uh, Mailware Bytes, let's kind of cover your background and kind of where you grew up. Sure. So I actually was born in Poland uh, when okay. I was three three years old. My uh, my parents moved us to Chicago, Illinois. I lived there pretty much all my life. Um, a year and a half ago, I moved to California, which is really the first place I've uh, I've kind of left Illinois for, and uh, that's where I'm running the company today. Okay, interesting. So, how did you kind of get into technology growing up? Like, what was your passion, or what got you kind of interested? I loved video games. Uh, okay. I also loved stealing video games because I couldn't afford them. Sure. Uh, so I was something like 12 years old, playing a lot of video games on uh, on the computer, the shared you know Dell that everybody had under their of course, under yeah. under their desk with the 56k modem. And I got my computer infected, and I guess the the rest is history, as they say. The parents were pretty upset. Sure. So. So what happened? So you you down you torrented something or or you well it probably wasn't torrents at that point but you, you downloaded a game from the internet and you got kind of your computer got infected and and you ha- you had to fix it or or how did that kind of come a beat to be Yeah that's exactly right. I think it was Kaza at the time or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. I, yeah, whatever yeah. the cool thing was at the time and uh I thought I was downloading a, a video game and I open it all of a sudden pop-ups are coming up, you know, my mom's my mom's over her, my shoulder basically saying what did you do with the computer? And sure. uh, I had to take matters into my own hands. So I went online. We couldn't afford, a, you know, I couldn't afford a video game, let alone a repair shop. Sure. So I went online. I Googled my symptoms, like WebMD kind of style, right? And uh, I landed on a forum of, of just volunteers all over the world that were helping people like me get malware off of their computer. And I posted my question and somebody came to my rescue. Um, but the whole process that she made me go through took like three days. So I said, to heck with this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix it. Sure. So, so what roughly what year was this? Just out of curiosity. So, I believe the first malware infection I had was 2002. So, okay. I'm 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 26 today. If you do the math, that was I, I think I was like 12 or 13 playing video games at the time. Sure. No, that's awesome. And just kind of curious to know kind of time frame because like I know I remember those days in in that kind of era. But just for the listener, right? So. I'm curious then, did you kind of take, did you go to university or any kind of post-secondary for for this stuff? Are you kind of self-taught or how did you kind of teach yourself to kind of basically build software? Good good question. The, the remaining part of the story, I guess, is, you know, once I, once I got my computer clean, I got to work. Um, at the age of 12, 13, my, my dad bought me some some programming books, and one of them was uh, one of those four dummies books, you know, the sure. yellow ones. Yeah, you know, yeah. Embarrassed to read in public. Sure. And, uh, so <laughs> I learned. Everybody's I, got them. <laughs> everybody's got it. Like, uh, you know, the finance people have something like PowerPoint for dummies. <laughs> sure, know? sure. So I, I learned most of my programming, uh, initial programming from that, and I decided to stick around that community of people um, that had helped me and automate some of these very tedious processes that they were making their their uh the people they were helping go through so instead of taking three days and 50 steps like i had to take i wanted to make that process more seamless now around that time 2003 2004 you know i start putting out these freeware applications that would automate these processes and and the antivirus industry is starting to fall flat on its face so the the mcafees the semantics whatever the antiviruses that were cool at the time uh fell from grace because malware was changing sure no, that makes makes a lot of sense. So, t- t- sorry to to answer your question then. Sure. Uh, so I went to high school, of course. Around that time, we launched the first version of the product in two thousand eight. Wow. And uh, in August of two thousand eight, I'm actually due at the University of Illinois. So I went to I- Illinois in Champaign Urbana, and uh, the the company's really starting to take off. Kind of a couple months before I have to go down there, so I have a really tough decision to make. But I ended sure. up graduating. Okay. So. What program did you take then? <laughs> Computer science. I learned how to program for real. <laughs> okay. No, that's awesome. So were you were obviously running the company while you were in school then too? 
I was running the company out of a dorm room. Uh, at, then, I, then I was running the company out of an apartment. And then I was running the company out of a fraternity house, which really? was a very interesting experience. To say <laughs> I, <laughs> I can imagine. That's awesome, though. But I, I think like a lot of kind of startups and whatnot um, kind of basically have kind of a similar story where they're started in kind of a dorm room or before college or during college or, or whatnot. And I, I think that's fascinating. And I can imagine the fraternity kind of trying to <laughs> program and while well, things are going on and partying and, and that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, I think it, it was for the better. Uh, my friends really kept me grounded throughout the whole process. The company's making, you know, some some serious money at the time. And, you know, I'm, I, I tell my friends maybe, oh, I got to go do this thing or I have a press interview. And they're like, all right, hot shot. Let's go to the bar. Let's get a beer. Don't, you know, stop talking so highly of yourself. So they kept <laughs> me really grounded through the whole process that's good though I, I think that's super important right because there's a lot of people that get this like huge ego and you need people to kind of keep it in check and it's oh. awesome that you had that especially when you were kind of being well you're still successful but like when you're kind <laughs> of growing into that success right I, I completely agree I think uh, part of the reason the culture of the company is as it is is because you know of the way my friends treated me and treated uh, the company and so on so I think it's a it's a good thing for sure Sure. So maybe let's talk. Okay, like you kind of covered quickly what the company is, but maybe just like let's cover exactly what the company is and what exactly it does, because you guys do different things for personal and kind of business. Yeah, the whole thesis behind the the first idea of the product was uh, what exactly what happened to me. I, I had malware on my computer. Getting it off was really hard. And why did I get malware on my computer if I had an antivirus? I sure. mean, that, those were the two problems I set out to solve. And so I think we, we solved the first one first, which is let's build a disinfection product. Malware is on the computer. And I had met a, a guy on the forums, Bruce, who, who's actually my co-founder. Oh, and him and I were the first uh, kind of developers and engineers that were working on the project. Wait. So in two Oh, good. No, I just I'm kind of curious. Like, so you you met your co-founder on an internet forum. Oh, it's even better than that. So I'm 16, he's 35. Try okay. to explain. Try to explain to your mother you're working with a 35 year old guy building an anti malware product, and then on the other hand, try to explain to your wife you're working with a 16 year old kid on an anti malware product. It was a really interesting dynamic. Sure. No, I, I think that's awesome. I'm always kind of fascinating, but fascinated by how kind of people meet their co founders. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I just no, kind of wanted to elaborate I mean, on that kind of kind of thing. So, so you guys were working together. Um, at what point? Like, how long? Were you guys kind of chatting online before you decided to kind of co-found the company? It, it was so anticlimactic. I think we met maybe 2005, or I, I heard about him, uh, you know, through the forums on the work he was doing. So he worked at a repair shop somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally middle of Massachusetts, one stop sign in the whole town. Okay. Uh, and so he saw a lot of malware infected computers come through the door. Very similar situation he had no tools to remove the malware off the computers. So he was doing it manually. He was ripping it out piece by piece. So he knew a lot about it. So I met him online, uh, 2005, 2006. I was working on some separate projects that he was contributing to. And I swear it was as simple as an email to him saying, hey, did you want to build an anti-malware product? And I think the only response I got back was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, awesome. So there, then we got to work. Uh, and we worked maybe two years on building this disinfection technology. And in 2008, when we we launched it, the whole idea was these helpers on the forums making people go through 50 steps, they could just say, go run Malwarebytes and make it a lot easier. Sure. That's awesome. So how long did you guys kind of work together before you ended up meeting in person? <laughs> uh, we had not spoken on the phone. Uh, we, really? had not met, we had not met in person. All of it was through MSN Messenger. Yeah, I remember those days. Um, exactly. Up until maybe two, mid-2008. And, and by then, we had made a couple hundred thousand dollars. The company wow. had made a thousand dollars. So we said, you know, maybe we should meet <laughs> because it, <laughs> we were going to a, a, another event uh, in Chicago, actually. And I swear, it was just as anticlimactic. It was like a, hey, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. How you been? <laughs> that's sweet. That's awesome. So do you guys now work um, in the same office or you guys still kind of work remote from each other? We do work remote. Uh, the first 30, maybe 35 employees that we hired were uh, people from this community that were helping others. It turns out it's very easy to 
hire somebody doing what they're they already love that you know they're doing it for free um, okay and then just pay them you know it was very easy to reach out to them and saying look we started this company called Malwarebytes we'd love for you to come help with our support team or our engineering team you seem to know a lot about the topic you're already doing this for free why don't we pay you for it and it was a very easy sell um, so Bruce and I uh, were remote for the longest time in fact I had a, a partner here in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area that put the first office on the ground and and so I continued to be remote at the University of Illinois as the company grew here in the Bay Area. Interesting. So by the time I had graduated from college, we had maybe 200 employees worldwide. Wow. And I had to, I moved back to Chicago and I had to fly back and forth here almost every week, at which point I said, to heck with this. I'm, I'm gaining like 50 pounds on this damn plane <laughs> <laughs> and, moved, and moved to the Bay Area. Bruce continues to be in uh, Massachusetts, but he's a very good remote person, you know, kind of worker, uh, as many people are in, in our organization. Sure. Well, I I think that's becoming more and more common nowadays that, you know, you're looking for people with certain skill sets and either they don't want to move or they can't move or, you know, there's a handful of reasons. And like, why not? Right. So many it's becoming such so much more common, especially in in the States and other parts of the world. It just makes a lot of sense. Right. In a lot of cases. It is. It is. And and we we had some interesting moments here, just funny moments where, you know, we're we're looking at insurance for our office. And then we went, well, we've got a lot of people working from home. Do we need to send an email around to keep their workspaces (laughs) non-hazardous? Oh, interesting. (laughs) It's like keep scissors off of your desk at home, please. You know, it's just <laughs> like weird, uh, weird emails exchanged. But uh, I think we figured that part out. So, so I'm kind of curious to know, um, maybe then, if you want to talk quickly about some of the maybe challenges and kind of how you guys have kind of sorted those out with having a remote workforce kind of worldwide. Yeah, it's tough. You know, it, it is becoming more common, and there are tools that uh, that are working better and better to bring people together. Uh, it is tough, uh, you know, having 200 people in the Bay Area today, 150 people remote. It's wow. uh, it's it's a tough, especially with four different offices. Even though there's, you know, some of them are small, bringing all those people together is definitely uh, interesting. So we do a couple of things. Okay. We obviously use collaboration tools, email being one of them, of course. But sure. hip chat, uh, project okay. management systems, especially with you know engineers in one place, project managers in another, uh, bringing everything kind of online and that, that helps a lot. We use Google Hangouts in some ways. Sure. Um, I still don't believe teleconferencing has been figured out. You know, I use GoToMeeting here, this there, Go, uh, Google Hangouts. And, and the day I actually figured out that teleconferencing was broken was when I went to visit Google and they couldn't get Google Hangouts to work at home. At, really? at their own office. So wow. it's still tough to do a lot of the, the conferencing. Um, HipChat lets us do a little bit of that. So, we're, we're, you know, a lot of that is still coming together. Um, and then one other thing we do is, you know, I, I worked with some people for five years before I had first met them. Interesting. And the only reason I met them was because we called kind of an all team summit. So every year we fly every single employee uh, at the company, whether they're kind of a contractor for us or a full time employee. Uh, this year was in, uh, just a couple of weeks ago to San Diego. So we had 350 people in San Diego meeting wow. for the first time, you know, the majority of them. And food, drinking, a lot of events, team building, a keynote from me, uh, and then anybody that wants to do a track was able to do a track and explain what kind of work they were doing. So really brought the team together. We've been doing this three years in a row now, um, and uh, it's been going great. That's awesome. So you basically almost run your own internal kind of mini conference? That That's right. And, uh, you know... People get excited for it. You know, the new hires start talking about, you know, how many more days it is until the summit. And they've never even been. So sure. it's a pretty cool thing. We hope to keep, you know, keep going. That's awesome. So do you do it in different cities every year or is it always kind of in San Diego? A little bit of it is a budgetary concern. So two years ago, we did it in Las Vegas. Okay. Uh, you can imagine how that went. <laughs> <laughs> Probably your well, most we, expensive one ever. <laughs> surprisingly, uh, Vegas hotels are very cheap. It was like fifty dollars a night. Yeah, um, fair. So the the only issue is proximity to the Bay Area because of flights. Right. Um, so we try to juggle that, but we try to give people better. Ex- I mean, we can't fly everybody to Hawaii. It would just be <laughs> sure so expensive. But you know, San Diego is pretty close. Uh, Las Vegas is an hour away. Uh, and we're, we're looking for our next, uh, San Francisco was one of them, of course, but we're looking for our next one here in the next, uh, 12 months. Okay. So what time of year do you roughly do these? 
January. Uh, so okay. we, like I said, we had one four, uh, th- no, two weeks ago, three oh, weeks okay, ago. Okay. Okay. Um, so we try to do it in January just to get the year started because it's sure. a lot of it is here's what we're doing for the year. Um, and here's what's changing. Here's what's staying the same. And we talk about culture values, you know, all the, all the, uh, fun corporate stuff. But, uh, I think people really get excited from the direction setting because that's what, you know, people just need a vision and sure. the rest figures itself out. What are we going to be? And, uh, it works pretty well. So, so basically like how, how does it kind of work then? You, you mentioned kind of tracks and you give kind of a keynote, but so you have kind of internal people basically do presentations or do you bring in kind of people from the outside world as well or, or is it just kind of internal? We've done both. Okay. Um, there's a, a so, so we've done both in that uh, I, I start off with a keynote. Okay. Uh, basically just, you know, here's how we kicked butt last year. Here's how we're going to kick butt this year. Uh, it's maybe 20, 30 minutes. This year I had my other team members talk as well. So my VP of sales came up and said, you know, here were the numbers. Here's what the numbers are going to be. Here's how we're going to get there. And a lot of it is, you know, pumping people up and, and telling them, you know, what, what we want to accomplish. The uh, I have brought in external speakers. So a guy named Michael Lopp uh, okay. spoke for us once and he is the vice president of engineering at Pinterest. He was the vice president of engineering at Palantir, but he's got a great blog called Rands and Repose. Okay. And, and he also wrote a, a very interesting book called Managing Humans, and I absolutely love it. It, it just, the most nonsense, uh, um, no nonsense book around managing people. <laughs> it's, it's great. So he spoke to the broader audience and they really liked that. And then the rest of the event is basically who wants to talk? And they, they, they send us an email a couple of weeks in advance saying, I'd like to talk about this product that I'm building for the company because somebody else in the organization may not be intimately familiar with it. So sure. we curate those talks a bit, but it's really down to this engineer out of Clearwater, Florida, really wanted to speak about our cl- uh, cloud management console. We approved that talk. He came to the event and said, I'm going to speak about the cloud management console. He had an audience of about 100 people. Interesting. We, re- you know, we recorded it for anybody that missed it, but he went through the entire product and people learned a lot. So it's trying to get the facts out there, the educational part of it, you know, really meshing with the whole team. No, that's awesome. Uh, So maybe let's kind of change gears a little bit and kind of talk about a little bit more about like what kind of products you guys offer. And maybe let's start with kind of for personal and then we'll move to business. Does that sound good? Perfect. Yeah. So the the antivirus industry is one of the most broken industries in the world. Uh, 100% agree. <laughs> obviously, there are, there are much more broken industries, but, but antivirus, at least on the com- computer side of things, is, is pretty bad. Uh, you pay $90 a year for you know, basically an antivirus that doesn't do much for you anymore. Yep. And this, is, this was true in 2008. This was true in 2002 you know, when, when I founded uh, Malwarebytes. So, so our goal was to clean up the mess that these antiviruses were causing, which is the remediation product that we have, and then ba- basically to better protect our users. So when we launched the first version of the product, we said, cleanup will be free, and we will charge for protection because we need to obviously pay our engineers. Sure. So if you go to our website today, you can actually download the product and for free, do a scan of your entire computer, and for free, remove all the malware off of your computer. So, And then you can uninstall the product, and 250 million people do this per year. So. Our test, our, our commitment was back to the community. You know where where we said, anybody that has a malware infection like Marson did, uh, we don't ever want anybody to feel like Marson did. So we're gonna clean up your computer for free. Interesting. And we hope that you know buys enough goodwill that people then spend the twenty five dollars a year for our protection capabilities, and that's really what we offer on the uh, on the consumer side is just the ability to remove malware off of your computer. If you want to uninstall the product after that, that's totally fine with us. But if you want to help the cause and protect your computer, you, you pay $25 per year. Okay. No, that's interesting. How about the business side? So the business side is a bit uh, interesting. There's a huge shift um, in momentum on you know what's, what these uh, businesses are, are equipping themselves with. I think we've all seen all of the hacks in the, uh, in the news lately, the, the JP Morgan, totally. the Ashley Madison. Yep. Uh, by now, I, I think you and I have probably gotten our credit cards stolen, yep. you know, <laughs> multiple times. I, I know I have employees that have had their um, their uh, health care, you know, people that are remote that had their health care information or social security numbers stolen. Oh, so wow. businesses are, you know, unfortunately, they're, they're falling a bit flat on their face because there's a huge influx in the number of security companies, something like 3,000 security companies now, now offering enterprise software. Okay, interesting. But, 
the, the majority of them still use malware bytes for remediation. Um, <laughs> Computers, and a lot of it is just the business model that we have. People like, uh, you know, people people working at, let's say, J.P. Morgan. Uh, certainly, there's somebody there that you know, out of the hundreds of thousands of employees that they have, using our product at home and knows our product at home. They would go to work. They'd have the same problem, maybe a malware infection, and they they'd call over their IT guy and say, I, you know, I have this problem and I need you to fix it using malware bytes. And that's how our, our product gets rooted into a lot of these larger enterprises. Interesting. So the remediation is not free for businesses. We actually charge for that. Okay. Which but we makes do have sense. Some, which makes sense. And then we have something called endpoint security, which is very similar to what we do on the consumer side, just more enterprise grade. Okay. And it basically blocks malware through various different layers. And then if all you know, heck breaks loose, we still have the remediation capability. And, and businesses are moving more towards an incident response um, kind of protocol, meaning at this point, they need to assume there will be a breach, they need to assume they will be infected, and they need to be able to respond quicker than ever. And that's where Malwarebytes really, uh, maybe we were a little bit early with that, but today it's becoming a, a nice mechanism for people to be able to respond very quickly. If something like a, you know, one of their uh, perimeter software, so the, the thing protecting the network lights up like a, like a firecracker, that this specific computer may be infected, Malwarebytes gets shoved down onto the machine and cleans it up. Um, but we can also do the protection capabilities. So the consumer and enterprise offerings are, are fairly similar. There's a lot of uh, nuances that, uh, you know, that, that, are, that are changed. And of course, if you're a consumer, you only have one computer in front of you. If you're an enterprise, you may be managing hundreds of thousands of computers. So we built management capabilities. So basically, the IT guy never has to leave his, his seat. Interesting. So, yeah, and I'm so the, okay. And then I'm assuming that I like. Can you manage um, like remote networks as well, or remote computers? Sorry, as well. Yeah. There's a so so part of the good question. Uh, a lot of let's say law firms have mm -hmm. lawyers that travel all over the world, sure. and they may not be com uh, connected to the corporate domain uh, to the to the to the home network, basically. Right. So so we can certainly protect them, uh, and when they come back online or come back home, they can ping back you know all the information that was gathered or or all the malware that was removed. But the protection is isolated to that endpoint, so we protect the actual computers. Okay, interesting. So just for I guess just for the kind of the listener, I'm I'm kind of curious. Do you want to kind of cover um, the platforms that you guys kind of support? Like I, I know like just from your website and whatnot, you kind of have Windows and Mac, but do you maybe kind of want to cover almost like the difference between, you know, what you kind of do on the PC and maybe what you do on the Mac? And if there's any other platforms you guys support? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I, the joke is my Windows machine has been infected, right? Everybody. Sure. Uh, and and if you want to be safer, you switch to a Mac. I mean, that that's kind of the running joke in, uh, yep. you know, in the world or whatever you want to call it. And inherently, that used to be true. Today, it's it's no longer true. In, okay. in fact, uh, so on the Windows side, of course, there's a ton of infections. Mm -hmm. And when I was, you know, starting the, the company in 2002, that's what we what I got infected with on my Windows machine. That's what, you know, we built the original software for. So we support Windows XP, which is still very much in use, even at your local ATM. Totally. Uh, surprisingly. Yep. Which and, blows uh, my mind, but whatever. Blows my mind, too. You know, Windows, <laughs> Microsoft has stopped supporting Windows XP. Uh, and there are vulnerabilities and security vulnerabilities exploits found every you know couple of weeks. Sure. So that that's still scary, but the majority of infections certainly you know used to come from from Windows. They they are still a big problem today. Uh, on the Mac side, though, there was a company that piqued our interest a bit. It was called Adware Medic. Uh, yeah, not I a great, that. not a great name, not a great name, but <laughs> sure. We we looked into this company. A friend recommended it, and I went to the Genius uh, at the Apple Store. Uh, I think they're called Geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I asked him, you know, if a computer comes in with adware or malware, what do you use? And he actually said Adware Medic. So I checked the box and I said, wow, that's pretty powerful. You know, good test, good uh, good checkbox to have. So then I went home to my mom's Mac, and I, I ran uh, Adware Medic, and it found a search hijacker. Okay. So basically, anytime she went to um, a, a Google and typed in a website that, that, or something, you know, a search term that she wanted, it would take her to a completely different website and serve her advertisements. Sure. Now, 
that's not stealing your passwords. That's not taking your credit card information. That's not, you know, stealing your data off the, off of your computer, but it's annoying. Totally. And it's a, it's a privacy concern because these guys are collecting what, what you're searching for. Yeah. So we said, okay, you know, ma malware is starting to make a, uh, it's starting to become a problem on the Mac. We've seen some big kind of influx of malware and a lot of it was certainly search hijackers. So, uh, like I said, the, the stuff that just changes your, your search page and, and collects information on you and serves you advertising, but also true actual Trojans that, you know, may steal data that may encrypt your hard drive and say, we want you to pay money for it. And of course, uh, rogue as well, software that, uh, pretends to be something it's, it's not and charges you money to, to, you know, on top of that. So we, we saw a big, uh, influx. So we bought this adware medic company and then we built an Android product as well. Okay. Interesting. So like I'm, I'm a Mac user and, I, and I've used Windows and Mac since pretty much like the early 90s and kind of even in the 80s a little bit. But, you know, I think like, yeah, the Mac's probably a little bit more secure than than Windows. And it's interesting that you're, you kind of are, are, you know, helping people on the Mac as, as well. And I'm, I'm kind of curious to know more about Android a little bit and what you guys kind of do on that, that form. Because I think people just need to be aware of this stuff and I think majority of people are like well I bought I bought a Mac I'm fine or you know I my smartphone's fine but I, I'm just kind of curious to know what you guys are doing on Android as well and and then maybe after that if you want to want to give people you know some more examples of kind of what they should look out for on their smartphone yeah I, I I'm pretty uh uh bearish when it comes to malware on mobile meaning okay. I, I don't think it's that big of an issue just yet okay we certainly remove uh so our product uh collects some telemetry around what we remove off those off those android devices and surprisingly we remove a lot of russian sms trojans ones that actually charge you money off of uh phones in the united states interesting so it's a really interesting data point. I, I, I was shocked that we would even do that. Um, but, but beyond that, Android and iPhone are, uh, are such locked down platforms that as a security vendor, we actually can't do anything fun and nifty on those platforms. So I'll put it in perspective. If I were a security uh, product, I'd like to hook into the Android phone. And anytime you visit a website, before you're actually able to connect to it, I'd like to check it out first. So okay. that, that way, so Android, you, you type in Google.com. Android says, hang on, Google. I'm going to have Malwarebytes check if Google.com is legitimate and then release it back to you if it is. So Malwarebytes would say, yes, it's legitimate. Go ahead and let the user go to that website. That's not how the architecture of Android is designed unless you root your phone. Right, right, right. And the most people don't root their the phone, right? And it's a bad idea to do so. So don't, let's not even talk about that. Sure. <laughs> uh, but the, the real architecture of Android is, hey, Malwarebytes, I let, uh, I let Marson go to Google.com. And, and how does that help, right? That doesn't – sure. the damage has been done. And the same thing with application installations. We, we have to react to a lot of things, and that's not a good security architecture. With Windows, before you actually open an application, Malwarebytes is alerted that Windows has re uh, received a request to open an application, and then it's allowed to investigate it before it, it passes it back to the user. And that's, okay. the real, that's a real good security architecture. Sure. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And then um, I, I know iOS is a lot more kind of locked down with that sense. Like, is there even anything you guys could do on iOS or is it not even really a concern? Yeah. Not only is there nothing we can do because there's no APIs, uh, there's no architecture that we can hook into. It is uh, prohibited in the, the uh, license agreement with the, uh, the Apple store oh, okay. that uh, if you provide an anti-malware or antivirus or any kind of security application, now there's some pri uh, pri uh, privacy ones that are okay, but true antivirus, anti-malware, you're going to be banned from the App Store. Okay. Uh, at least that was true two years ago. I, you know, I, I haven't looked at the iPhone uh, App Store recently but i know it was true two years ago sure and i guess the only way kind of around that is the jailbreaking community but again that's, that's right. so small and most people don't jailbreak their phone exactly okay so I, you kind of have this like freemium to premium kind of model I, i'm kind of curious to know I, I know there's like always been a huge kind of debate over the last couple of years whether freemium actually kind of works and it seems like in your case it really has and and I you don't need to kind of I don't really necessarily if you, if you're not comfortable um, mentioning kind of 
the, the percentage of people that convert, that's fine. I'm more interested in just kind of knowing um, kind of how you guys make that kind of work for you and any kind of advice for people that are kind of looking to do something similar where they give like a free version and then say pay yearly for extra features or or whatnot yeah i think uh, it's a great question by the way and i can i can certainly tell you that conversion rates in any freemium model are less than one percent okay and the problem with people that uh, I don't want to say bash uh, freemium or, or, or you know say it doesn't work is simply they just don't understand it they, they okay. don't understand freemium and and it's a very uh, it's a very interesting model but one that takes a lot of care and feeding okay uh, taking care of your users giving them repeat access to free products and then eventually you know playing the long game understanding that they may convert down down the road downstream. We have people that have used the product for two years for free before they even convert. Okay. So a lot of these companies, uh, after six months of freemium, panic because the revenue stream isn't there and start shoving advertising into the product. That is no longer freemium. <laughs> right. That is ad-supported software, which a lot of people that love freemium actually frown upon. Sure. And it's also probably a little bit weird for you guys to put ads in kind of a like a malware type product, right? Oh, it's the worst thing you could do. I mean, <laughs> sure. it's stuff it's stuff we blog about every day, you know, that this advertising platform was hacked. I mean, we we would we would be in pretty bad shape should that ever happen and to to avoid that problem in general, we're just never doing advertising in the product. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. And I think you kind of mentioned something earlier where maybe I use the product personally on my home computer but then I, when I take it into kind of my work and go to the IT guy and say, you know, let's use this product on the work machine, like, and then their pay, like the company I work for ends up paying for it, is, is probably a pretty good model for you guys, I'm, I'm assuming. Is that correct? It works great. So I, l let's say last year we had something like 250 million uses of the product, which wow. is a lot. That's awesome. Um, Congrats. Well, thank you. I, I, you know, that's <laughs> this is where freemium is really interesting because, you know, less than one percent of that, let's say two million people mm -hmm. uh, bought the product. Now, sure. th that's a healthy business. That's a very healthy business. It lets me pay for my engineers. But there's a cherry on top of that. Uh, the other several hundred million. Uh, were obviously employed and went to work and and it, what what shook out of that was several hundred uh, leads per week, several thousand leads per week of real legitimate businesses coming to us and saying, "I want to buy malware bytes." So th that freemium model converted even further into you know enterprise sales for us, which is now half of our revenue. Okay, interesting. So you you basically leverage almost like the personal up to the enterprise. That's interesting. That's right. That's right. If you kind of build, if you draw a pyramid, you know the consumers are at the bottom, the large Fortune 100 are at the top, and it, it just it, it moves upstream. Um, and we we typically even start with just small departments in large organizations. Okay. Um, let's say you take a hospital, you know, a big hospital account for us. It's likely that we might have started with a, a couple of consumers, nurses, doctors, maybe one of the IT guys knows a little bit about malware bites. Uh, and then we started maybe with you know radiology or oncology, maybe maybe uh, neurosurgery, whatever the departments would be. Uh, and then eventually, you know, there's enough of departments in the organization that the C, uh, the chief Inform uh, information security officer went and said, well, let's just buy an enterprise license of malware bytes, and that lets us deploy even further. And then the whole the whole business is using the product. No, that that's actually really interesting, um, and and actually kind of fascinating to me. So, how long is usually that conversion rate, like like you said, it could be a couple of years. Yeah. Is it is it traditionally kind of a year or two, or or can it be longer than that? Like I'm just trying to get the listener to kind of realistically understand how long it can take for you to become successful from like kind of a freemium to premium model. The yeah, it. <laughs> I wish I had a lot of historical data. Okay. It, it it took weeks or months, kind of in the beginning. Now there's a lot of word of mouth, goodwill that that Malwarebytes is is you know attributed to. So we actually see a big chunk of our user. Let's say let's say a million users convert per year. Okay. Um, about fifty percent of those convert immediately after the scan found and removed the malware. So we show instant benefit, and that's where. You know, a lot of the conversions come from, and then there's a 14-day trial. There's another 25% that come 
after that. And then the other 25% is this long tail. It might take forever, you know, to, to convert that user. And then business leads even further out. I mean, you, you have to build a brand. You have to get people talking about the product. You know, it takes it takes a while. But uh, if you can show immediate benefit, I mean, that's that's pretty powerful. Actually, that's that's actually really good advice. Immediate benefit is, you know, you you can convert. And if you guys start at twenty five dollars, it's that's not that much. Like most exactly. people can just be like, yeah, no, no big deal. Right. I'm just going to handle this and take care of it and be done with it. Um, one thing that I am curious about is you mentioned about a 14 day trial is, is that like, have you done any testing around kind of doing like a longer trial or a shorter trial and like, or was there any reason you kind of settled on 14 days? So we, we haven't, uh, we haven't built the infrastructure to be able to, to try out the different days yet. We're, we're working on that right now actually, okay. because it's a really interesting test to run. Sure. But I can, I can tell you that, um, from 2008 to 2010, so from when I started the the pro, when we launched the first product to around 2010, we had no trial whatsoever. You can run the re- the removal and then just trust us. Buy buy the product for twenty five dollars. Okay. And uh, we enabled a fourteen day trial and conversions doubled overnight. Interesting. Okay. So people got to actually try the product, which is a no brainer. I mean, it just seems obvious, but but on, you know, we were running too fast to even. Think about it. <laughs> sure, no makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, but then you look at it in a, from a regular person's perspective. I mean, if you and I are buying something, we sure as heck want to try it, right? Yep. No, it makes sense. But the the thing is that sometimes it's sometimes like it seems obvious once you add something, but it, it's interesting that you there's certain things that you almost need an outside perspective to actually give you something like like that where you're like whoa we should add this and now it doubles our conversion and i think it's super important and the thing that's interesting to me about that is that you are you constantly are trying new things to to kind of convert faster or make it better for the user oh there's even there's uh there's even better things than that so okay <laughs> Do you want to cover in, some of those? Or? Oh, sure. I, this is this is just hilarious. Um, so in the product, there's a buy now button, of course. Okay, uh, sure. If you click that buy now button, it takes you to a nice little page inside the product that tells you here's what you get. You know, we want you to we want to be open and honest, and here's the product, uh, uh, the actual features that you'll get. Here's what you'll pay. So. Obviously, a lot of people see that experience, and the way they feel about that experience is it determines whether they're going to buy or not. Um, right. Same with you and I. If you go to a site that looks really complicated or not necessarily reputable, you're going to nope the heck out of there. You're totally. going to close that box. Uh, so we decided to do some A-B testing. And what A-B testing is, basically, you, you put two candidates forward, and you, you track the conversion rates of both candidates. So one will be a green button, one will be an orange button. And you see how many sales come in through each and how many visitors looked at both, you know, at each of them and you see which one performs better. Interesting. Yeah. So little things, little, little things like changing the button color from green to orange. I mean, yield 10 percent conversion increases. Wow. So That's the interesting. Psychology, the psychology. You would think price would be the biggest thing, right? No, it's how do you feel about the product? Is it warm? You know, does it give you enough information about the purchase? That's the kind of stuff that people really look at and it's shocking sure it's it's interesting because like i work as a creative director at a software company and and so i totally get this and i think that it's interesting and i'm glad that you brought that up because it is not about at the end of the day like what i think looks better or what you think looks better it's about what converts the user better right, right. And, and like it's it is fascinating to me that basically changing a button color can convert by 10%, but obviously we're going to do it. You and I might not like the color that converts better, but it doesn't <laughs> matter. I, right? heard th- I, I learned that the hard way, that uh, my opinion does not matter, and it's the data that drives the decisions. Totally. And, and uh, w- one of the experiences was this beautiful you know, box that says, here are the features you get. And that literally, word for word, that's what it said. And then it listed three or four nice features and a big now, uh, buy now button with the price very you know, open and, and evident. And then the other candidate, which is the one that actually won, was just a wall of text. And it looked so ugly. It was just testimonials from 100 customers jammed into a tiny area that we could put in. And it converted like crazy. Really? People wanted to see. It was just nuts. I mean, so, so you get the point. I mean, totally. 
it drives people like me insane to, to see yep. the data and go, what are you doing, guys? <laughs> I know. it's I, I know. That's the thing. But I, I think it's super important that, you know, businesses think about this stuff because, you know, like me being a designer by trade, like I cringe sometimes at what converts better. But when you're when you're thinking about it from the business side and the user side that, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. And like I get it. Everybody thinks that they're department is is like the most important and whatnot but at the end of the day i think sometimes we forget about kind of the user and what converts the best and what they prefer and at the end of the day 10 percent to change a button color is a huge reason to change the button color oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> right totally agree. I, i'm kind of curious though do you have any other examples for kind of the listener that that you know you made kind of like something like a simple modification that converted or change the conversion by a significant number? That's a good question. You know, we do so many tests, so, so many okay. tests. Um, but well, then maybe if you don't have like a specific example, do you have kind of uh, I, other ideas on kind of what you've tried, um, other tests like A-B testing, um, user testing? Do you kind of like want to talk maybe about other testing, not necessarily specific examples, but other things that you try to kind of get user feedback? Uh, on the renewal side, so obviously a, a customer is as good as uh, that customer is with with the company. So renewing the customers is very important, of course. Yeah, uh, we've we've tried some interesting stuff that's worked pretty well. A letter from the CEO on why the company was founded, uh, what we stand behind or stand for, uh, and why a renewal is so important to us. You know, to to keep the business going. Sure. Uh, that that that's worked pretty well. Um, just being open and honest. You know, putting stuff like values, culture on the company makes people in. Uh, enticed to buy the product at least on the consumer side i mean when i buy you know products online i i check out the management team page i check out the the about us page why the company exists what problems it's trying to solve maybe i'm just weird and no <laughs> no i do the same thing and to be fair like i've done some um kind of user testing and a b testing in my past and and even just watching analytics that a lot of sites even whether it's just like a brochure website or it's a startup or or you know you're building a physical or digital product a lot of people and a lot of your your most trafficked pages on your website are your kind of team management pages like people really want to know like who's building the products and services that I use exactly. and it, that was so fascinating to me because like you mentioned like I thought it was just kind of me at first before I kind of <laughs> realized this right but well, people do their homework and they're curious yeah, and there's some really great pages out there. I mean, go on like Tesla's website. Sure, right? you love see, it. You, you, see, you see their vision, their mission. Uh, obviously, Elon Musk. We all know Elon Musk. Sure. But, you know, who else is part of the company? Why are they there? And it's a lot deeper than just how we build electric cars. You know, that's yeah, that's not what Tesla's about. <laughs> no, you're right. And I think that's super important to kind of stress that people want to know about the company. And it's interesting that you kind of give a, a high-level CEO update when, when renewal time comes along. And you know, it's it's awesome that that kind of converted for you. That's fascinating well, we were, to me. We were doing some not so great things, like you know, maybe ten days out, we'd say, "Hey, your product's renewing. Good luck." Not not. I'm not saying seriously. You know, that's sure. what we were doing. But you know, it turns out if you reach out to the customer several weeks ahead of time and say, "Look, you know, your renewal's coming up. Get ready for it." You know, some people need to to shift money around or need to change their credit card information. I mean, right. all that kind of stuff needs to come into consideration and then an update to the company or what, what we've been doing or what your renewal is going towards uh, definitely helped. I mean, it, it, you know, little things like that. Interesting. The what your renewal is going towards is interesting. So you're basically telling them we're building these features and they're coming in th the new year or something? A lot of it is very, uh, very high level, such as, you know, hey, we've hired 150 engineers since the time we last spoke, which oh, okay. maybe was the last renewal. Uh, and we're kicking malware's butt even better. And we, we're introducing this new feature that's going to be rolled into our product. It's in beta today. And that kind of stuff goes into those emails. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. We're running out of time here. But I, I just kind of want to get your thoughts on kind of where do you think the whole industry is kind of going? And is there kind of anything that people should kind of look out for in, in 2016 and kind of beyond? Yeah, the like I said, the antivirus industry in general, the security industry in general is a very broken industry. I think there's a lot of new companies such as Malwarebytes that are coming out of the woodwork to to make some reform happen. Sure. And uh, you know, a lot of these 
old traditional antivirus companies spend a lot of money on sales and marketing. And the new wave of technology companies are, are exactly that, technology companies. They, they spend money on engineers like we do and sure. build technologies like we do. So I think there's going to be uh, <laughs> a lot of new security companies. Uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens and how they shake out. I, I definitely think that security is top of mind for businesses, for consumers alike. Yeah. And uh, I think 2016 is just as dangerous as 2015 was, you know, back up your data, change sure. your passwords every so often, run anti-malware, antivirus software, um, practice clean hygiene on, on the Internet. I mean, don't don't visit websites, you know, you shouldn't be on. Totally. And you don't post photos or, or anything to the <laughs> Internet that you don't want potentially to get hacked at some point. <laughs> exactly. Any, any data you put on the Internet expected to be to be stolen. Yeah, that's that's uh, really good advice. I think it's it's only going to kind of potentially get worse over the coming years as bigger and bigger companies kind of get hacked. You know, like it, it kind of puts <laughs> things in perspective, right? I, f- I feel like we've left it on a very depressing note. So uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I, right, it's here to help. <laughs> no, no, I think it's good. But uh, like part of it too is I, I want to be kind of real about this stuff, right? Because I, like I think in some ways people are just starting to really care about kind of their online privacy security. And, and whatnot, and I think it's and, – and why I kind of wanted you to on the show was to basically get people kind of saying like, here's the problem and then here's the solution to that. And I think what you guys are doing is the solution to, to a lot of this stuff, right? Well, yeah, thank you. And uh, users can go see if they have a problem with their computer just by downloading Malwarebytes. So we still have that service for free. No, that's awesome. So maybe let's kind of close the show with promoting um, – Again, kind of what pe- what you guys kind of do for people on a, on a personal or business level quick, just in case people came into the show a little bit late, um, and then where, where people can um, download the software, and then if you want to promote any social links um, that people can kind of check out with the company or you personally? Sure. So, so just to recap, our, our uh, consumer product basically can scan your computer, find any malware that's on it, and, uh, and remove it for free. And uh, for $25, we can protect your computer going forward. We work alongside any security solutions you already have. On the business side, uh, very similar. Uh, we have a lot of management capabilities, but it's incident response, basically responding to computers that might be, uh, might be infected or breached and, and helping you out there. Uh, if you want to learn more about Malwarebytes, just go to malwarebytes.org. Uh, at the very bottom, there's also the social links for Facebook, Twitter. We're very active on both, and uh, we're very happy to, uh, to to chat with you if you'd like. Awesome. Marcin, thanks again for taking the time into your uh, busy schedule. I wish you much success in 2016, and it seems like you guys are growing like crazy, and I, I think that's awesome. Um, you know, Thanks again for doing the show, and uh, I'm excited to keep in touch with you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks, man. Likewise. Thanks, Kevin. Perfect. Later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.